Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio. This is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. On today's show, we continue part two of our interview with Claire Headley. Claire was, for many years, a senior executive in the Religious Technology Center. Claire, yesterday, uh, April 30, 2014, was David Miscavige's 54th birthday. Yes. What happens inside the C organization on COB's birthday? Well, um, in the years that I was there, it really depended on the mood and flavor of the day. Um, I can remember in, let's see, I think it was 93 or 94, there was a huge big party at the, the ship, as it's referred to, the, um, the clipper ship that's located on the in-base. Um, and there was music and dancing and, you know, anyone that was in good graces was invited and called up there to go to that party. Um, that was obviously a long time ago. Um, in more rec- more recently, Miscavige um, definitely did not involve any of the base staff in celebrating his birthday. About the only involvement the base staff had was that they were expected to or rather we were expected to give up um, all of our pay for at least a week, sometimes two, maybe three weeks, to fund whatever extravagant gift uh, had been asked for on his list. And that was the case for everyone on the base, definitely everyone in ASI, everyone at Flag, uh, the ship, um, pack base. I mean, if, you know, the entire Sea Org essentially would pony up to pay for whatever gifts he'd asked for. So you're being paid uh, $50 a week or less. Yeah, most and less. You have, I mean, yeah, less. 46, okay. 46 if, it, if, if everything was going as planned, which most of my time in the Sea Org, it was not. When you get paid $46, they withheld, they withhold money. Yes, they for, withhold tax. So what was your net on a full pay week? So it was $50 gross. $46 and some cents net, of which they paid out $46 even. So okay. so with the pay slip that we would receive, it, would, it was a, a white slip with a yellow slip attached that showed the taxes and it showed the gross and the net. And it had two $20 bills, a five and a one, if it was a full pay week. And on weeks when it was COB's birthday, David Miscavige's birthday, you had to hand the money back over. Yeah, immediately. And most oftentimes the payroll officer would have a spreadsheet and, you know, she would have everybody's names on there and how much she was collecting for Miscavige's birthday and would check off as people gave her the money back. Do you recall some of the gifts he wanted for himself? Um... I can remember expensive suits, um, gosh, I don't, uh, I don't. Well, how about, how about the, how about the year that he wanted the BMW? Yeah. So, and, and sorry, just a side note. Um, the reason it's so hard for me to remember what he was given is because it was never something that I ever physically saw. It was just something that I paid for along with everybody else, you know, (laughs) Oh, I understand. So you might you might not even be told yeah, what you're buying. Yeah, definitely COB. not there when it was opened. You know, God forbid. <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah. So so the year that Miscavige wanted this BMW, um, uh, and I think I had started to men- touch on this the other day, but it was um, ASI and their staff decided that they were going to purchase this for him. And ASI had a very different pay arrangement than all the rest of the C organization in that they received, they regularly received high dollar bonuses. They, you know, they, they wore regular civilian or civvies clothing as it's referred to in the C org, um, meaning they didn't have to wear the C org uniform. They wore normal clothes and they were always expected to look like a million dollars. Um, now, let me interject here for our listeners that don't know. ASI is Author Services International. It is a for-profit corporation that is part of Church of Spiritual Technology. Yes. So as I understand it, Claire, correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, 
Author Services International works for L. Ron Hubbard or his estate, and it works to collect royalties for Hubbard. Right. That's right. And does most of the money Author Services collect go to Church of Spiritual Technology? Yes. Okay. So they get paid better because they're a for-profit. And last I checked, uh, the secretary there is Ryland Hawkins. That's right. I, and they're all yeah, yeah. Are, uh, author services. They're all Sea Org members. Yes. Yeah. So in other and words, in fact, they are. Um, you know, that's considered. Well, it's it got equal clearances to RTC. Like you have to be approved by Miscavige to be an ASI, and you have to go through extensive sec checking. You like, in other words, I, I don't know that it's necessarily realized, but you can't. You can't be a Sea Org member in ASI. You can't be approved for ASI unless you also have clearances for the base and so on and so forth. Okay, understood. So the the ASI, the, does the BMW get purchased through ASI? Yes. And as far as I know and what I was told by Barbara Ruiz at the time, who was the ED ASI at that time, um, they now, what, is that, what does that mean? So uh, that's executive director. So in, in our in normal world terms, she's the CEO. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah. So Barbara Ruiz, is she in charge of getting the money to buy the BMW for yes. David Miscavige? Yes, and she was, she was absolutely um, the driving force behind the purchase of that car. But, but as I understood it, essentially what happened is they figured out the cost, the number of staff. They gave those staff an extra bonus, prorated it to account for the taxes that those staff would then have to pay on that bonus, and then they and then ASI bought the car. So the title was in ASI's name, and then that was then presented to Miscavige as a birth as a sorry as a Christmas gift. Now, what during the time they were, this car is probably a hundred thousand dollars plus was the was the enormous word ever used uh yes and that was definitely so as i had started to touch on the other day the reason i found that that i heard any details about this is because barbara ruiz after the fact was then sent to be sec checked over the fact that she got this BMW from a scavenge and because it was in ASI's name, it massively complicated matters and would absolutely be questionable if ever, you know, reviewed as inurement. Um, and that was always a huge concern. I hadn't, honestly, I hadn't even heard the word before I became internal exec RTC. I didn't know what the word even meant. <laughs> so, um, you know, when I when I took on the position of internal exec, I was had to approve the financial planning for RTC every week, and that's where I first heard the word was from um, the Tresec RTC, Barbara Griffin, um, and she was she clearly told me that she had to be very careful, and there was a huge concern about inurement practices from Miscavige. Could you tell our listeners what enormous means within a uh, 501c3? Yes, absolutely. So, and and again, this is as I understand it. I'm I'm of course no expert on the subject, but enormous, of course, yeah, is using the funds in a 501c3 for personal benefit and gain. Um, you know, and obviously that is above and beyond ordinary salary expectations. Um, so questionable use of a 501c3 profits funds is how I would kind of sum it up. And, and that's well said. Now, in addition to the BMW, uh, which I believe was an M6, David Miscavige is very fond of Acuras. Yes. And he has an Acura RL, uh, Acura TSX, also a Mazda Miata Range Rover, an Acura uh, that he keeps in Clearwater. Yes. And these are these Cars of David Miscavige is all paid for through Sea Org birthday gifts? Um, I don't think they're all through Sea Org birthday gifts. But I definitely think that they're they're I'm sure that if we did a title review, they're not all owned by Religious Technology Center. 
I see. What about now, David Miscavige also has a penchant for very expensive stereo systems. Yes. And one figure put out there is $10 million for all of his systems that are scattered throughout the world. Yes. I mean, how does that get paid for? If he wants, a, you know, say a $250,000 sound system in one of his residences, how does that get paid for? Um, as far as I know, it gets paid for by Golden Air Productions or by RTC, depending on, um, you know, if it's a studio facility in Golden Air Productions that he uses, then Golden Air Productions pays for it. Um, and, and again, I think that's where there are blurred lines um, you know, that, <laughs> I mean, ironically, his favorite saying was follow the money. Like, absolutely, his favorite saying in the world was follow the money. But I'm sure that if an outside party followed the church's money, then they would find absolutely that, you know, whatever he says goes, and it doesn't matter whether it's being purchased by Golden Era Productions or RTC, it has to have Miscavige's stamp of approval on it, and any significant purchase is approved by him. Well, he certainly would consider all of the money to be his. Uh, going to a th something we talked about off the air, we were talking about Academy Awards and Oscars. Yes. And you told me that David Miscavige had an Oscar made for himself? He did. <laughs> what, what was I mean, <laughs> I... <what> was, <laughs> I know, looking, yeah. thinking about it now, you just mentioned the word, and all of a sudden I was like, oh, my gosh, that's right. You you r reminded me. And again, you know, I, you know, I had a very shattered uh, small perspective of things, as did most, pe most CIRG members there. But the way that I knew about this is because Marion Powell, who was at the time the PA, which stands for Public Affairs, she was the Public Affairs head for um, religious RTC, Religious Technology Center. And um, so therefore, one of her things to, that she was responsible for, one of her duties and functions was staff morale. Anyway, so in the interest, I guess, of staff morale, she had an Oscar made for David Miscavige. Oh, and you know what? Now I remember. <laughs> okay, it, this was for yeah. his performance. In the uh, that TV show in uh, 1991. Oh, Ted Koppel. Yes, Ted Koppel. <laughs> he got an Oscar for that show, courtesy of Marion Powell. Because, uh, because really, Ted Koppel didn't deserve an Oscar. Really, it was David Miscavige who made that show what it was. And, of course, that's quote, unquote. Therefore, he needed an Oscar for that. But look at the confusion. This is really funny. It's one. It's the ultimate in sucking up to the boss. Yeah. Hey, boss. Here's an Oscar. The actual word Ted Koppel got for the '93 interview uh, was an Emmy. Yeah, there that's you for go. television. <laughs> but and, and so he has. Jeff, it, it may be that I mix that up because you know I didn't even know what an Oscar versus an Emmy was. I mean, gosh darn it! I hadn't watched TV in 15 years. So but forgive me if I mixed it up. But as I remember, it was an Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's not important. The, the point is yeah, that yeah, of course. Ted Co Ted Cobble got the award, so, but he has to give himself the, the bigger, yeah. bigger and better award. Now, the Ted Cobble interview at, at points, uh, David Miscavige comes across like a deer in the headlights, and this is kind of why it's funny out here in the Wog world, right? Yes. Uh, he 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 at one point talks about the uh, Siberia bill, bill where the psychiatrists were going to lock up millions of people up in Alaska on some, you know, million acres. And I'm watching this. I remember 93 watching it, <clears throat> thinking, this guy's nuts. Yes. <laughs> it, 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 there's no Siberia bill. It's, it, I, I, and back then there was a John Birch Society, and that's an old term for older people, Birchers, and I thought, this guy's a John Bircher. Uh, now you might call him a survivalist. So he gets an award for his appearance. Generally, after an event is done, does David Miscavige ask his, uh, you know, his uh, subordinates how he did? Um, I mean, what yeah. what happens after the big event is done? Does he, and he walks off stage. What happens when he walks off stage at one of the big events? So he he goes to the green room, of course, and that's where anyone that was a speaker at the event is there. 
Um, if if one of those speakers messed up pretty badly, then they're already in sec checking, um, being interrogated for what crimes they committed, that they would dare to flub on the same stage as Miscavige. Um, but otherwise, if the event went off well, then he'll be back there, uh, you know, saying how great it was and 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 he'll then avidly wait for the feedback, quote unquote. And feedback was a common term at the ant base and of course it's not it's not uncommon in the real world, but what the feedback was specifically is that everybody every staff member and especially the management staff, RTC staff, you know, prominent figures in the Scientology organizational structure were to write up a statement of how great the event was and, you know, especially anything related to Miscavige and his presentations and so on and so forth. And that would go to him that same night uh, for his review. And, And secondly, after the feedback or sometimes before the feedback, if there were, if there was any release at the event of lectures, any courses or anything else, he would be, of course, getting the figures of how much money was brought in, how many were sold, etc. So he wants he wants fawning praise. Yes, I did great. And then, how much money did I make? That's right. That's, uh, I mean, that sounds like a uh, corporate CEO. But I digress. Uh, he's very volatile, David Miscavige. When did you become aware of the, of the physical? violence of the abuse of the workplace abuse um the first time that i witnessed it firsthand was in um clearwater florida in 1996 and that was um you know i was sent there from the imp base in march 1996 to become an rtc representative in training and so myself and 20 other trainees um for for the same position were there and um and i was present at a meeting that miscavige held with ray midoff um and there were a number of rtc and other staff present at that meeting but it was in the parking lot at the sandcastle and um miscavige was you know yelling and um cussing out ray midoff and shoved him several times um and that was the first the first time that I saw it, you know, hands-on personally. And thereafter, I, I mean, I witnessed hundreds of, hundreds of instances of him being physically violent with probably close to a hundred staff. And this just became known in the church that he would kick, hit, punch? Yep, Absolutely. What set David Miscavige off? Was it arbitrary? Could he just be set off by looking at him wrong? Yes, absolutely. It was 100% a roll of the dice. It could be that he had, it it could be completely disrelated to even anything that actually happened in a meeting. He, He could arrive at the meeting having come off of a call with lawyers or God knows what in a God awful mood. And you just never knew it was, um, you know, it was uh, a culture of fear, violence, uh, you know, fear of the unknown and what might happen. And then for some reason, this is this kind of escapes me, you know, not having been in Sea Org or, or really in the Church of Scientology much. I mean, I had auditing way back when I saw as a, you know, a low level PC. Mm-hmm. And uh I did see some disturbing things in the church way back when, but but nothing like what you're describing. So when you're living with a, a someone who's narcissistic, violent, one question I have is, you know, me as a man, if someone hits me, I might hit him back. Right. And but but David Miscavige is he is he always surrounded by an entourage, including bodyguards. Yes, absolutely, and 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 uh, most often, including. Lar- some large males like Marty is not a small person. No, no. You know, Greg Wilhair, same thing. I mean, you know, um, Russ Bellin, Tom DeVocht, you know, at different times would be part of that entourage. Um, and then 
he also, there was this position in RTC called IGMAA, which stands for Inspector General MAA. MAA is Master at Arms. That's the ethics officer, the person who, um, you know, is going to get your ethics in, get you to be a conformist, uh, compliant little, and whatever you want to yeah. call it. <laughs> um, a good Sea Org member. Yes. So he had IGMAAs um, that were most often well-built large males, and they would literally walk around with a baton stick under their arms um, and, you know, like, for example, Ty Webb, um, Alex Marty was one of them. Um, there were a number of them. Anyway. So if David Miscavige, he, he arrives with an entourage, what, 10, 12 people at least? Yes. Yes. And, and, and so, and I think the other thing that's hard to understand is the isolated culture of the sea organization, and especially at the end base. I mean, you're in the middle of nowhere in the desert. There's there's no, you know, Sea Org members don't have cars. They don't have phones. They don't have, you know, open access to anything. So you're completely at, at the mercy of the environment in which you're surrounded by. Um, and so, therefore, you, you quickly learn that your survival in said environment depends on your conforming to the rules um so the last thing you're going to do is attack the, the the head of the entire joint you know no, I, I, no I matter what he does sure i understand that you know i i uh, grew up in the assemblies of god yeah uh the pentecostal church is extremely authoritarian and the pastor is basically held up to be god i mean i mean obviously or god's representative right and you know, I wanted to emphasize for listeners, in some aspects, some religions, not all, but some religions can be a prison in your own mind. Yes. You feel trapped. So, you know, in the Assemblies of God, I was not free in my own mind as a young person. Right. Even though I could come and go, I had a car and I could come and go, I still felt in some ways trapped by the church. Yes. My, my behavior, conduct, you know, if uh, my, my pastor was a very good man, but he could be mercurial, very, sometimes very angry. And people tended to put up with his bad side because they felt he'd been called as a man of God. And we owed him our obedience. Yes. And if you add it to that in, uh, isolation, confinement mm -hmm. on a religious compound, it would intensify. That's right. And, and there are, the, the fact is that there are many aspects of, Scientology that when when you set it in that setting um, it becomes very much smoke and mirrors and specifically what I mean by that is if you have a bad thought about somebody it means you've done something wrong you know it, it is instantly reversing back on yourself and so there's a lot of um, self blame and oh it couldn't be him it must be me and you know all of these other things oh i'm pulling it in pulling it in means the motivator factor that's covered in scientology something bad happens to you well that's only because you've done something that therefore motivated you to <laughs> you know pull in on yourself some bad thing um and all of those were very prominent in in, in for me anyway as a Sea Org member i mean you know God forbid that I would even think about leaving. I mean, even I did. You know, I used to have nightmares about trying to get out of there. And I couldn't even say I had a nightmare because I was like, oh, my God, this is going to be translated as I'm having thoughts of leaving, which I was. But I wouldn't even acknowledge to myself that I so badly wanted to escape from that hellhole. No, because that, that there is what's called thought stopping. Right. And, and that's part of indoctrination. I think maybe uh, thought stopping is an interesting phenomenon, and it ha it happens in cults. It happens in religion. Uh, when I was a Pentecostal, I could not have any bad thoughts about my pastor. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it, it, in Christianity, you're taught that's Satan, the devil, putting those thoughts in your mind. Right. And so you become afraid of your own thinking. You don't trust your own thinking. Yes. You need the group, the Bible, the Word 
to do your thinking for you. Right. And, and part of the loss of my faith when I was a young man, uh, 21, uh, when I was suddenly liberated and free to think for myself, it was astonishing. Yes, I, I and completely it was, relate to that. I mean, to me, one of the most damaging things for me personally was the, you know, in the, the, the category of critical thinking. You know, because really, I mean, if somebody wants to believe in Scientology, then great, go ahead. But what's why is there truly a problem with hearing other views, hearing people's experiences, hearing what, what other people went through who worked at different levels? What is the problem with that? If you, you know, in an, there's critical thought doesn't, doesn't, it, you know, doesn't block that out, but yet it cannot exist in the Church of Scientology. No, it can't. And the, when you think about blowing, they, there's a term of art in the church called blow thoughts. Are you having blow thoughts? Right. So what? So you're living in a, a, a you're living in an environment where David Miscavige is physically abusive all the time. Yes. There's there's pressure for stats every Thursday at 2 p.m. Stats must be turned in. Yes. You can't escape. On, on a practical level, what what was the critical moment where you said, "I'm out of here"? Well, for me. It was precisely the moment when I learned that Mark was on his motorcycle headed down Highway 79. And so M Mark Headley, your husband, had escaped. Yes, he had escaped. And, and what happened leading up to that is it was January um, 2005. Um, so my birthday is on January 2nd. And on the night of my birthday at 3 o'clock in the morning... Mark had radioed me, you know, we had the organization phones slash Nextel radios. He had one of those and I had one of those. Um, he radioed me and said, hey, do you want to go to Denny's for your birthday? Because he had a motorcycle that he could ride on the road. Um, anyway, I wasn't able to go because I wasn't, I, you know, hadn't been home um, by that time already in a couple of days. I'd just been catnapping at my desk of my office um and and then I didn't I I didn't see him again after that I hadn't been home at all um the night before he he escaped he radioed me again at four o'clock in the morning and asked me if I was coming home and I said I was I told him I was going to try and I would at least try and come home and take a shower but you know I was working on the org boards and postings um which was you know repositioning everybody on the int base from the top exec structure down that had been a project ongoing for years already by that point. Anyway, so I, now, so I was, when you say, when you say coming home, Claire, yes. uh, is that apartments by the, by the base? Um, I mean, actually, what is home? Yeah, We lived in a room in one of the houses on sublet road. So it wasn't even a half a mile <laughs> from the property. Um, it was on this little dirt road that, that was adjacent to the property um, that had yeah. these little houses on it that that um, Gold had bought up uh, so that there wouldn't be any quote unquote wogs living close to the property. Um, we lived in a room in one of those houses. Okay, thanks. I, that, and Sublet Road, by the way, if you, you can Google it, you can uh, use Google Map and you can see Sublet Road. Our listeners, it's it's the church did buy up the houses. And just to interject, Claire, WOG is a really derogatory term. It is, yes. Oh, WOG is so, it's the N-word. It's really, in the Church of Scientology, a WOG is a subhuman, filthy, dirty, degraded being. That's right. And so the Church didn't want any WOGs living near the base. That's right. And that's, to me, we'll talk about that another time. So you have Mark on your motorcycle he is blown for good yes literally and so he had radioed me at four o'clock in the morning asked me if, if i was coming home i never made it home and then i had fallen asleep at my desk for 30 minutes or so that morning gerald duncan the six foot black gentleman walks in and tells me that i need to come and see jenny devocht um right away jenny was the co the the head of the Commodore's Messenger Org International at the time. I walk into her office, of course, in a daze. I've, I've been up, you know, lack of sleep for days. I was 
I had suffered extreme weight loss at that time. Um, and she tells me, oh, Mark has blown. <laughs> and literally my whole world just came to a screeching halt right at that moment. And I was like, excuse my language, but what the fuck am I still doing here? <laughs> oh, yeah. So you're, you're, you're sleep deprived. Yes. Extreme. You drop weight. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I was I was down to 100 pounds. I mean, it was bad. Oh, my. You know, I'm 5'7". It was not. I was. I I thought. I I actually thought I had cancer um, because my adrenal glands were rock solid. And I remember going to see the medical officer and I told her, I, I said, I think I think I have cancer. And she was like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, my my adrenal glands are rock solid. I feel rocks. And she was like, oh, yeah. no, no, you're just uh, you just need to take some B vitamins. You'll be fine. Is this a, is the medical officer a doctor? No, no. A, a nurse? No. Actually. So you have a a, a, a non medical person to you take B vitamins. Yeah. So so Mark Mark has blown. You're devastated. Yes. Are you in trouble because he'd blown? Yes, I was. Um, you know, of course, I was now. I knew that he had been under investigation. I just hadn't realized how bad it was and what what exactly was happening because I hadn't spoken to him. I mean, you know, yes, we were married, but about the only thing that that meant at, in terms of life at the Ent base is that we we had a, a bed in, in a room together. Um, it didn't mean that we ever slept in the bed at the same time. It didn't mean that we ever ate meals together. It didn't mean even that we ever saw each other. I mean, there would be Sometimes days or weeks would go by, and I would never even see him. Because uh, one thing Church of Scientology, Sea Org, does not like is marriage, children. Yes. They're, they're not. They're not pro-family at all. No. In fact, in, in fact, fact, I'd been under pressure directly from David Miscavige since 2000 to divorce Mark. Why did he want you to divorce Mark? Because I was a uh, you know, a high up executive in RTC and he called that sleeping with the enemy because Mark was in a lower organization and, um, and therefore m me having a relationship with him meant that I, I was privy to, you know, things regarding Miscavige that Mark wasn't. And therefore, uh, that posed a threat to miscavige and in fact so, that was ultimately why i was kicked out of rtc in september of 2004 was solely and only because i had not divorced mark so even though you love your husband your man and wife mm -hmm. miss miscavige and and it has been said correctly that scientology is always the third person in the marriage bed yes david miscavige is worried about pillow talk yes and and here here's the punchline um Okay, so like I said, I was he I mean I could I could list off for you for hours the specific times times and places when he pressured me to divorce Mark. It was on and on and on. And finally in September 2004, I was kicked out of RTC because I refused to divorce him. In January 2005, I escaped 3 weeks after Mark and reunited with Mark. You'll never guess what I heard last year. Guess who, who quote unquote, was responsible for breaking up marriages at the end base? Who? Me. You? Yes. Miss Gaffage oh. blamed it on me. Oh, man. Yeah, they blamed it on you. Yes, because I was long gone. So, of course, I mean, hey, <laughs> you know, hey, you know, don't let the that door hit you on the way out. At least we have a, a, a scapegoat now for that travesty. Oh, someone to blame. Yeah, that yeah. that thing in uh, corporate life, whoever has resigned or been fired, they're to blame for everything. They become the scapegoat. Yes. And because David Miscavige is completely unwilling to take responsibility for his atrocious personal conduct, decided to blame you. Right. Uh, and, I mean, it's just so ironic on so many levels. Um, there, it just defies logic. Like, why would I implement something that would destroy my own marriage of 13 years at that time it's it it just defies logic no but that's part of the outrageous betrayal of uh the church of scientology is very much it's a culture of blame 
heads on pikes, abuse, yeah. make wrong, invalidation, and generally soul raping, you know, malicious conduct. Yeah. And when you're pushed to the breaking point and you blow, Claire, what we'll do on our next uh, interview, because I want to go on with this, uh, I'd like to talk about your actual escape from the base because I you you told me this story before I, I've been at uh, you know uh, when you had a party in Burbank your old house yeah I, I remember meeting you and Mark there and you to, you told me part of the story and it is just shocking yeah. what they tried to do to get you guys back yes yeah. and it's it's almost like this mommy dearest thing where. You're going to be abused, but if you dare leave, if you dare show that you don't love me, there will be hell to pay. Yes. Yeah. There, hell there are so many earth. factors that correlate to um, abusive domestic relationships. You know, anyway, we and it, like you said, we can cover that a, a later. There are just so many corollaries. I read, read a book, uh, Trauma and Recovery, and it's about domestic abuse and um, recovery from that. And there were so many things that I benefited from reading that book it was just unbelievable well Clara one thing I like to do on the show if someone in the Church of Scientology a public staff or Sea Org member is listening what would you say to them I would just say you know you here's the thing at the end of the day make the choices that you know are going to uh, make you free really truly in the sense of, in the truest sense of the word you know, be true to your family, be true to your, you know, be honest with yourself. Because, you know, if you open your eyes and look around you, I mean, <laughs> what your life is what you make it and it's what's in front of you here and now. You know, um, you can't, the, like, if I were to be able to talk to my mother, who I haven't talked to since 2005, she is missing out on so much for what? For nothing. You know, she's she has no relationship with her grandchildren. Neither does Mark's mom. And you know, there's no there's no rhyme or reason to that. There's it's not saving anybody. It's not benefiting benefiting any, anyone to do that. Uh, you know, it's just continuing a lie. Um, so, you know, real honest to God review and um, you know, just being honest with yourself about what's really going on is what I would suggest. That's kind of the starting point. And from there, don't be afraid to peel back the layers of the onion and have at it. Claire, that's very, very powerful advice for anyone listening. The Internet has a lot of information on it. And I would add to your very good advice, don't be afraid to read the Internet. Yes, absolutely. And open your eyes and don't be afraid to think. Yes. Claire, you've been a wonderful guest. We look forward to having you on the show again. For Surviving Scientology Radio, this is Jeffrey Augustine telling you that we'll be in very good touch. Thank you for listening.